Well, we know of Elon Musk and Tesla and how it's breaking ground and paving the way to the future in the automobile industry. But have you ever heard about Elizabeth Carmichael, who rose to prominence when she released a fuel efficient three wheeled vehicle during the 1970s crisis? They thought they found a solution to the problem of the gas crisis, winning over car makers and investors. But the mystery unfolded regarding the car's technology and Carmichael's surprising past. This is a rise to fall, murder to deceit, and capitalism at its worst. Well, we have today the director of the HBO four-part series called The Lady in the Dale. We have director Nick Camilleri exploring the one-of-a-kind story of fraud, family, and identity. I'm Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told. Please welcome for the first time to the Truth Be Told studios, director Nick Camilleri. <laughs> There he is. Hey, how's it going, Tony? I'm thank good. You me, well, thank you. And uh, thank you for being a part of a, a great project. Like I said, you know, truth be told, we're always trying to find new, new subjects, new titles, new everything to bring to the table. And this is one that I have not heard of before. Elizabeth Carmichael. Uh, you know, I was born in 19... Mm -hmm. but 69. So I, I, was, I was really young when I was uh, in the 70s. So... Uh, that was not one of my passions was cars. Uh, so yeah. could you could you tell us about who Elizabeth Carmichael was and, and, the, and, and what happened? Then we'll get into a little more details. Oh, my God. I think that's why I needed four episodes is really right. to answer that question <laughs> right? of exactly who Elizabeth Carmichael was. Um, I mean, you could you, you could pick any chapter of her life and it would literally be describing a completely different person. And it's you know, she's the, the same uh, incredible fighter, entrepreneur, mother mother of five, and trans woman. But it's really a question of which chapter are we talking about of her life? And there's a beginning where she was a, a career criminal. You can call her a grifter or a counterfeiter, an embezzler. Um, there is, there, there's that aspect. And right. then there's the aspect of the Dale automobile. So is she, in, in your eyes, a failed entrepreneur? Is she a con artist by the very nature? Is she a fraudster? You know, depending on how you want to view her, depending on how you view, I guess, um, the aspect of being an entrepreneur uh, was she delusional was she in fact uh, defrauding people or do we want to talk about the trial herself where she was her own lawyer and defended herself <laughs> in a seven month trial or do we talk about the rose business where afterwards she picked up and then after getting out of prison finally she started out with a, uh, an incredible rose business hiring men from all over the state and effectively offering them second chances and opportunities to redeem themselves in their lives so so there, where do we uh, start? Yeah, fire away and <laughs> pick a section, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll do our best, Tony, to unpack it. Well, well, first, well, I mean, we'll start with you know the car industry, and especially back in the '70s. I I do remember a, a little bit about the gas crisis, um, how it was you know shortages and lines of cars waiting, and I'm sure what's funny is I even when I was in science class in my high school. My science teacher was always talking about these scientists and people that created cars that ran on water and, you know, trash and pretty much everything. But the car companies completely, you know, bought the patents and shelved them. So, first of all, how did this, now we find out it was a fraud, but how did, it, how did Elizabeth get this far with, the, with a, a concept when... I mean, there's so many people I'm sure that saw the, the, the plans and, and the, the, every, the sketches and the prototypes. And how, how did it get that far to even get her noticed? Um, well, I, the first thing I would say is, is a, it, it, my first reaction is to say, I think what's good about the series is that it really leaves as an open question about whether or not that that was real or not. Oh, got it. I think that that's I think that's important because I think there's enough evidence on either side to be able to make that case. Um, so I, I try to say is, is personally that uh, I leave my own opinion out of it because <laughs> it's, our job is just to present what's there and let everybody make up their own minds. Um, but in that regard, I think what was amazing is that she really had um, more ideas and I think more industrial and entrepreneurial spirit than I think most people who ever entered that field. Mm -hmm. She her native intelligence, her drive. I mean, she was. Tireless. I mean, Dick Carlson in, in his interview, um, I don't think it's in the doc. I can't remember. But um, but she says, you know, he describes her as indefatigable, saying like she was tireless, like she would just keep going and going and going. And it was clear from listening to the way she talked that 
that she was, she not only had a native intelligence to her, but she was smart about so many different things. I get to use the term polymath mm-hmm. to describe her, but that she knew everything about everything. And it was very clear there was a, a there was, it, it's not in the doc, but um, Richard Charles Barrett says that when they were growing up, a parlor trick that uh, Liz used to do um, before Liz's transition, it was a, a parlor trick that used to be done was that uh, Liz would open up a, a phone book any book and say, you know, tell me what's on, you know, you look at it and then say, okay, Richard, what's on that page? And then Richard, you know, Richard would say, Richard would pick a page and then uh, Liz would say, oh, there, here, here's exactly what's on that page. Bop, 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 wow. bop. And then Richard goes, that's exactly what's on the page. And it was, it was very clear that not only did she have a photographic memory, but I think that kind of intelligence, she knew so much about so many different areas of not just the automotive business, but just of advertising and marketing. And she could put it together. She, Dick Carlson said that she spoke in 30 to 45 second sound bites. So she said that they were perfect to be edited for TV. <laughs> like, so you're talking about a finely tuned machine, someone who was right. by in their very essence a business person. So the fact that she's entering a field, like it, it, it gives her this kind of indomitable spirit and presence and offers that kind of cult of personality that's starting to form around that time. You know, you, you kind of see it with, all the attitudes that people have who came to work in that company for her. They were all right. like, she was incredible. What an amazing leader. Like she never let us down. It was like clear that she cared about everyone. I mean, she would elevate everybody. Even Jerry McGinnis is in the doc. He has an anecdote saying that, that, you know, he was once called um, to the offices. He was working in the R and D lab in Canoga park. And then he was summoned to the Encino offices <laughs> of 20th century motors where right. he was pulled into Liz's office and Liz goes, okay, Jerry, what's next? And then Jerry's like, wait, what do you mean? What's next? It's like, what's next for the company? And it was like, like don't you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and so, she's, so the fact that the fact that she's asking an 18 year old kid, like, you know, what are your thoughts? We want you to contribute to this. I think it's like, a, it's a, it, there's just one of many examples of her leadership. So I think there's a lot of internal stuff to, to really answer your question, hone it down, which is that she had a lot of people on the inside who loved working for her. And externally, she was an incredible marketer, and not just an incredible marketer, but an entrepreneur and a mother of five. She's incredibly inventive. Everything about her, I think, could be one person's sole trait. To be like, I'm a good entrepreneur. No, she was a great mother of five. Also, lived her lived experience as a trans woman was remarkable too. So it's like everything about her, I, I thought, was was fascinating, and also. It, I think that lends itself to your credibility doesn't just come from your product, it comes from the person who's selling it. And she was the credibility, but, all that. But, yeah, go ahead. But no, but do you think that her intelligence, because sometimes I notice when people are so smart, they're also common sense. Because don't you think if you're so smart that you eventually you're going to get caught in this lie? Or is it just because of the the fame, the power started getting to her head? Or I mean, how? Why? Because it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't make sense. I'm just an average, average smart person. But I would say, ooh, I'm I'm eventually going to get caught. Sure, I, I think it's really a question of depending on it, it's. I think it matters what lens you're viewing it from because right. the way I look at it is that, um, and it's talk, it's talked about in the series and there's a book by Maria Konnikova who we interviewed for the documentary, but she ultimately didn't make it into the cut. But her book, The Confidence Game, talks about how most businesses fail within three years. So the level of delusion that it takes to be an entrepreneur is so high. Mm -hmm. You're often the only person who believes in something. And most of the time, it doesn't exist until it actually exists. And so I I found a lot of similarities between Elon Musk and Elizabeth Carmichael in the sense that, like, in 2009, Elon Musk was an hour from bankruptcy. And everything right. his, his entire company was about to crash, right. and he literally bluffed his way to giving the, to having the, his own board put up like fifty million dollars or something like that. When he he just completely bluffed them, got the money, and got through it. But like he lied, he misrepresented right. so much about the company at that time. Right. But like you could easily make the case that like I, I look, I don't have a business background, but I read a lot of business books. And I could tell you that what I connected about Liz Carmichael and what I liked about her was that she was she was not doing anything else. That any other uh, company, like 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 I was gonna say, um, like Chevron or Dupont or Coca Cola or Budweiser, right. like I've I've read the books on August Bush, I've read books on Dupont, like I know that everything she's doing is no different than what major corporations do. The only difference is that it's what rugged individualism, it's socialism for the rich and rugged individualism for the poor, like. All the rich do is just knock everyone else out who tries to play their game. So to me, I view it through a little bit of a different lens, which is, it, which is, to what end are you lying? 
That's right. and to me, it's like there's so many lies that are necessary for an entrepreneur to get by. It's like I, the number of extra legal things I did to get this documentary done. I've committed probably no less than six <laughs> felonies. So right, it's like, right. but I, but you do so much, and it. But all that really matters is what's your end goal, because it. I think it makes it a little bit harder to view it because. Um, to kind of close out this thought, I think it makes it a little bit harder to view it for me, I think, as a lie because there's a legal term called um, the, con uh, the presumption of continuance, which means that if you were a career criminal your whole life and then you made a jail car, it's easy to assume that that's just a crime, too. Right. <laughs> so it's, you know, but there's, there's, there's far too much for me. And I, and I think I can say that as objectively as possible. There's far too much for me to say that that's just simply a lie. I, I look at certain things that are in the documentary, which I won't talk about here, but I, right. I, I think they, because I don't want to spoil anything, but right. I do think that they all make the case that, that the word lie, I think can mean about five different things. Right. And, and it all depends on what your motivations are and that nobody's really clean cut. Even somebody like Elon Musk is not clean cut. No. So, so when you're all. saying, could you get caught? I, I see it more like, are you going to succeed? Like with what you're right. trying to do, right? Well, yeah, well so in Hollywood, they I say it. "fake it till you make it." So there, yeah. <laughs> there, there I is mean, a. It's not wrong. No, I mean, there's there's, no. there's so much about it that you have to. So much of it is it, your your image is based on those things, which is what you can carry and lift up, and right. that's really it. I mean, and I think that applies to kind of every aspect of every business, which is that that aspect of "fake it till you make it." But it's you know the problem is is that the, the tide turns on you real quick because America loves success and hates failure. Right. So if you succeed faking it till you make it, you're incredible. Right. You know. And right. if you fail, you're a loser, and yeah. everyone hates you. It you know it's it would be criminalized and penalized. Like it, there is a very fine line between that those two things between the very great successes up here and the colossal failures. And, and, it, so, you and know, it's, it is true yeah. because even investors they don't care what you're doing if you're making them profit. When you lose their money is when they care and what what are you doing behind the scenes. <laughs> that So yes, I mean, that is true. So a lot of people don't care if you're succeeding and they're happy because they're making money or see, oh, look, he went from this to this or she went from this to this. But if you do fail, you lost my money or, yeah. So you, there is a, yeah, it is funny how it, yeah. the American it, oh, capitalism, that's why I said American capitalism at its worst because you know, it's about taking a risk and making yourself successful. And this one, unfortunately, did not turn out the way she wanted. Yeah, well, I think, I guess maybe to that point, just a few seconds on that, which is like, I, mean, I think the important point is to reframe the conversation as a, instead of being caught, which is like more so viewing Liz Cromwell as kind of an anti-hero, which is like someone who does bad things, but for good reason. Right. I, right. I, to, I think it's certainly, I'm not saying to a, you, know, how, you have to adopt that position, but I certainly think that, reframing it and seeing it through a different lens, I think it's like crucially important to understanding Liz Carmichael as a person. And also to understand that everybody is flawed and has nuances and has complexities like that. And it's, you know, and to say that somebody's like, oh, well, it's just a scam or it's just this, it's like, I think that's somewhat of an oversimplification, but I think I just go back to the anti-hero thing, which is like, <laughs> I think Liz Carmichael is one of the best anti-heroes I've ever seen committed to, to TV. Like, Part of the reason I did this is because I thought she was a remarkably complex and flawed character, and that's what made her so incredible. So when we talk about that success or failure, the lie or being caught, I look at it as being like, well, if you had succeeded, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We, I'd probably get in my jail car and drive somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, and it, it's another fascinating thing. And, you know, for the people that's just tuned in, uh, this is Nick Cam Camilleri, since it's uh... – the Italy ways. Uh, so, and we're talking about uh, The Lady and the Dale. It's an HBO four-part series. And uh, we were talking about Elizabeth Carmichael. And not only this was in the 1970s, this is somebody that, you know, brought a, I'm going to show a little picture. It's, it's a three-wheeled car, uh, energy efficient, which was unheard of back then because they were gas guzzlers. I know my dad had a few. Um, and but not only that uh there was a lot of we're gonna say lies or whatever to get to the top and hoping it turned out the way she wanted but she was also trans which is unheard of to even get in the public eye because back then i mean even now people shun trans people uh so how, could you go back a little bit further and, you know, without giving everything away so people, we'd want them to watch the, the show, but when, when was, was Elizabeth 
part of the auto industry before the transition? And how did how did that happen? How, not the transition, uh, but how did how did he, how did she get into the auto industry? Uh, my understanding is that there were a couple different jobs that they're not in the documentary, so I feel fine talking about them, which are like which are like that Liz and well. Even prior to her transition, it's more accepted. So we'll, we'll just continue to call her Liz, even when we talk Liz. about the crime. Okay. And we talk about pre-transition. It's always, as I've come to understand, it's better to, to do that, just retroactively call her Liz. So that's what I'll do just going forward. But okay. um, <laughs> so, so Liz, in, in terms of prior to Liz's transition, there, Liz had a job, I think multiple jobs, working as a car salesperson. So, she, so not only did she work there, but also she stated that she had a background fixing up cars and doing stuff like that, which, you know, we don't know if that's true. That's, I think, what makes Liz Carmichael sort of exciting is how much of this is a, is a, is a fabulous idea, you know, or is uh, Liz writing her own story, so to speak, you know, and, and how much of this is, is rooted in truth. Right. But um, but so the, so there's it's scattered about. The, you know, at one point I think she said she was the soapbox. She won the the women's soapbox derby as a kid. <laughs> so there's like this, these different ideas I think that kind of litter throughout about automobiles. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that really came around was when she worked at USMI, and that's when she saw the concept for the Dale automobile. Oh. I think that's probably the closest, most comprehensive and complete timeline, and sort of sort of the most concrete era of Liz Carmichael's automobile building phase is when she worked at an invention company called U.S. Marketing Institute. That was in uh, Encino, California, hmm. which is on Ventura Boulevard. And so she she worked there, and then that's when Dale Cliff came in um, with the plans for the Dale Automobile. So it's the understanding that she claimed, and then this is alleged, we weren't able to verify this, um, so obviously I say it with a grain of salt, but there's, <laughs> she claimed that she had a background in automobiles, saying that she had worked uh, at a couple different uh, the big three companies, but not in any high. It, she never claimed to be in a high role. It was always like somewhere lower, like I did this or I did that or I fixed up cars and, and claimed that that's what she was doing and she was helping create the prototype for the Dale. And so she was like, I'll use all my engineering knowledge, you know, but there's not like a firm background on that stuff. So it's, it's, it's really about who do you, you know, who do you want to believe and, and what does your gut tell you? <laughs> how, how, how because i mean i couldn't imagine of trying to go into these business meetings and i don't know if this is if this is true or not i'm going to show this picture you can tell me if it's right is this a, a picture of of liz being arrested as a man so this would be liz pre-transition pre-transition so, okay yeah 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 so like like i said so that's liz that's liz on the left as we would say that's liz representing as male right and then you would say on the right that's liz representing as female so, the, yeah. so, so as a male, was he in, uh, uh, was he arrested quite a bit or is it, what was, what was he arrested for before? Yeah. Um, so there's a long litany of, there's a long rap sheet that goes back very far. Actually, uh, I wouldn't want to spoil it because I think <laughs> it, it speaks to the theme right, and right. some of the feelings and tone and style of the show that it's, uh, I would only describe it as a catch me if you can type of, uh, <laughs> feeling to it. Um, but there is, we actually do employ several pages of the FBI files. We had over a thousand pages of FBI files. We highlight some of that stuff in the very early goings of episode one to kind of establish um, Liz's background when she was representing male. Yeah, so that's, uh, but I would just say this is that it's, it's a colorful background of counterfeiting, alleged arson, embezzling. Um, yeah, just a lot of schemes. Just scheme, uh, with, uh, yeah, just scheming. Just every day, every week, just, you know, at one point, it's not in the dock, but in, I don't believe it's in the dock, but there's a one point where um, the police enter in 1959 and they discover a whole row or a whole bookcase full of criminal law books. <laughs> and basically realize that, that Liz, while representing male, um, basically had decided to become a career criminal oh, and, that she, and that she would be quite difficult to catch. And even after Liz transitioned to the, the FBI files lost the trail because they were like, because Liz's wife, Vivian, when they were still together after Liz's transition, they, um, it said, you know, Vivian seen with a woman named Liz Carmichael. <laughs> and so it never, they never really caught on that Liz had transitioned. So, uh, so you have all these, but her, basically her background was, were all these crimes. Um, yeah, I don't want to, I'm trying, I'm so hard. Right, right, right. Right, we so don't want to give it death, away, but. There's a lot of crimes. And, and they're all endearing. 
<laughs> so, so how far into this where Liz finally uh, bit off more than she could chew? When, when did they finally catch on to say this is something's not right here and uh, it started falling apart around her? Um, I, I mean, I, I think that probably began when um, KBC re reporter uh, Dick Carlson and, and KBC producer Pete Noyes, I think, started to go kind of dig into her because they felt that something was off uh, about Liz. Um, and that's when they started to investigate her. That timeline that tracks is about, Jan is about January 1st, 1975. Mm. So Liz had been operating from basically September until December. So basically for roughly that three-month period, they're no, excuse me, that four-month period. So you've got September, October, November, December. So she's operating and bringing in all this money, doing all this stuff, and that basically right around the end of December, early January, she got the attention of Dick Carlson and Pete Noyes. And from there, that's when they started. They started picking up the uh, uh, picking up the scent, and they started really investigating people, investigating. Um, God, there's so many good points in the documentary. I'm trying not to ruin this. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess I'll say this one thing because that'll help, which is that at one point, you know, Carlson goes investigate this test drive that takes place. That's the, the climax of episode two is the test drive um, to bring in a bunch of money for the company. And at one point, Carlson, after that test drive, follows an engineer to a bar and the, and the engineer admits, well, I'm not actually an engineer. He's like, I'm, I'm an actor paid by the hour <laughs> to wear a lab coat oh and my pretend God. that and talk automotive jargon like we know what we're talking about right and he said and he goes we did it for you we did it for some other tv reporters and so um and then that's when dick carlson gets the fingerprints from the engineer they meet a few times he gets the fingerprints and then it becomes that so what i'm saying is, is like there's you know you, you've got that element where carlson is really digging to find i mean he's digging and digging i mean you you can't discount that he has the same level of intensity i think that liz carmichael has so I don't think there's any doubt. It's really just that the, the question really becomes about his motivations to do so right? Um, and why he's actually pursuing her. And, um, and so, I mean, so that's, that's more of a, of a question for the series, but I think as Carlson and Noyes, I think digs deeper and deeper, some of the stuff starts to come to light to really question what is really happening and how much is happening. And, you know, is this real? Is it right. not real? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm curious, um, if Liz, when she created the car, was it based off of another, like a, a car that was already existing? Because even though very smart and intelligent, uh, where was the concept? Where did the concept come from? Was it already just like a, like just put a different body on like a Chrysler? I mean, what did, how did she create this? So that, um, yeah, that's from episode one where uh, Dale Cliff comes into the USMI offices with his own idea. He's, he's built a prototype. He's driven it around down Ventura Boulevard in Encino. And then it's not, I don't believe it's in the dock, but there's a man who comes up to him and he's a waiter at the restaurant saying, yeah, I think I know somebody who could help you with your car. Right. And, and saying this person was Liz Carmichael. Uh... And so and so he ended up at USMI. He goes to meet with Liz. They meet for hours. They talk. And then Liz says, I love this idea. He goes, you know, we can really help you with the gas crisis. And saying that like this car, here it is. Like, let's do it. He's like, the, you know, she's saying this wouldn't be hard to kind of prefabricate and put together. And so she takes that idea and then they go together and then she says, well, why don't we just call it the Dale? And then they, <laughs> and that's you know, named it after Dale Cliff. And so she saw that idea. She, you know, they filed the paperwork. I mean, just, I think the pictures alone of her with the car, I think are do, do, I think they do a lot of work to really tell you a specific message about what her intentions were with that car. It's just, you know, it's rare evidence of, of her along with that car, which I think is probably the most, I mean, to me, it's very striking to me, you know, about not only just where the car came from, but what her decision was and how she presented, how she presented, I think it displayed those emotions towards the automobile. Right. So a lot of times when people finally, people start looking at them, investigate them, uh, and they start questioning what this, the ethics of the person, they get desperate and they start conspiring. What, uh, what links did, did Liz go to try to keep things under wrap? Was it, was, I, I heard one word murder. I heard. So what, what, what links did she go to keep 
this going and and keep her out of the spotlight where they're keep investigating her? Uh, well, there was one point that's in the documentary where uh, I feel like by the end I'll just be recapping the entire right, documentary. Right. <laughs> but uh, but there's a but there's a part where at Noise and Carlson are getting closer to figuring out you know what's going on with Liz, what's going on with the company, and like you know these guys are these people are being paid out of you know these people are being paid in a you know out of a cage you know, with, with two chairs at a table and a briefcase full of cash and next to it is a 357 Magnum. <laughs> and so it's like, yeah. So anyway, I, when they go in to do that, I think there's something very interesting about like, not only that this is all happening on that level, but the fact that when Noise and Carlson are getting closer to understanding how the company works and what's going on and how these people are being paid and like what the timeline is to completion, you know, it's they, they're, um, the reporting picks up and starts to advance more and more they start doing more and more segments to the point where um yeah carlson says on the air he says like people say that we're obsessed with this story he's like we're not obsessed he's like we just we don't have all the answers and we want the answers and so they and so their investigation got got so much more intense that many of the employees of the company are saying like why are you coming after us why are you doing this it's like we're trying to create something that would be great for the world you know we're trying to put this together and so when they when the investigation kind of reaches sort of a tipping point, uh, Carlson is backstage at KABC, and this is in the documentary. Carlson's backstage uh, when a grip uh, comes up to him, and you know, one of the members of the crew comes up to him and says, "You know, hey, I'll give you a couple thousand dollars if you stop reporting on this car." Hmm. And so he realized immediately that it was a bribe, <laughs> that like he was being bribed. He said somebody had gotten to the grip, and it was clear that it was it, that that somebody was Liz Carmichael. And so, it, you know, so that's, that's his anecdotal story. You know, we don't, we couldn't find that grip, nor we could, could we find any confirmation from anybody else on the crew that that had occurred. But then again, it's anecdotal evidence. So, but he tells that story. And I think that that story is very telling. And then it, right. there's something, there's another part that's not in the doc, which is that, which is that they were, they were driving somewhere. Oh, they were leaving. It was Pete Noyes, the producer was leaving. Um, the KBC parking lot and somebody shot at him and put a bullet in his windshield. Oh, wow. And so it's like between the bribe and the gunshot, you know, it's like they knew they were on you know, something. There's all this. What did you say? I said they knew they were on to something that like somebody wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a real question. It's like, what are you trying to hide right. and what is really there? And, you know, but I also think that, like, again, that's not abnormal for major corporations. I mean, industrial, there's a reason why industrial espionage is a term. Right, like, right. It's very real. Like, you know, yeah. and you're saying, well, that's just this. And how much, you know, and to me, that raises the question of how much is this is really a class bias where you say, well, I hate Liz Carmichael because she tried to bribe them. I'm like, have you seen what DuPont did? Like, <laughs> see what Nestle did? Right. Nestle stole all your water and sold it back to you. Right. So like, you know, it's like they sold it back to you for $3 a bottle and that water belonged to you. It's like, it's like, you all the things that they do the level of pollution you know coca-cola like there's a place in guatemala where the term where instead of murder the term coca-cola is used <laughs> right. does that not tell you that source for that is the book the coke machine by the way so <laughs> if you but like that's a real thing like so for people to say well i, I think this comic was a villain and i'm like what do you think about coca-cola and dupont and nestle i'm like they're villains too like they do worse stuff Oh, than constantly. anything Liz Carmichael did. So I, I think it's really important to kind of contextualize it. The question is like, what are they on to? Right. But I think also you need to reframe that class bias to say to yourself, like, what are they on to? But also, isn't she just trying to do everything she can to succeed? And that really is, again, I'm not stating that that's my position, but more to say, I think it's important to think about all the nuances of the story. And she was a mother of five. And how, I mean, I'm sure you had an opportunity. I think they're in the documentary, a few of the, the children. Did you get to speak with the children and what, what was their take on it? You know, cause most of them were probably pretty young at the time as adults. What was their take on their mother today versus as a child? Was it more, well, I, I, no, I'm just going to say, was it more, you know, you know, I still love my mother, but you know, didn't agree with what she did. I mean, how, or were, was she a hero to them also? Sure. I, I think there's probably two ways to view it. I think, and they progress with time. So the first one being, I think, you know, Candy even Candy says in the documentary, my mother was my hero. Like, hmm. you know, she, they, they very much go into Candy goes into a lot of detail about Liz's transition. Right. So when Liz is representing as male, 
you know, and then all of a sudden saying, how would you like it you know, if I became your mommy? Hmm. And, and Candy was like, I thought that was great because, you know, because I wanted, I always wanted to have two mothers. And wow. it was like, so to say like, you know, and then you have Charles R Richard Barrett is Vivian's brother. And that's um, Vivian, Vivian being Liz's wife. Right. And so you have Vivian's brother saying, you know, oh, I think I know what you're doing this. You're, you're transitioning to hide from the police. And, and he says, no, this is really who I am. And it's, and I think that it's a, it's a really nuanced portrait of like, you know, you can still be um, like a criminal, but still have this very true part of yourself that exists that is untouchable from that other stuff. And I think that that's represented in the family's viewpoint. So like, despite them being on the run and despite all the obstacles that they face, that consistency within the family, I think is, is the most grounded um, cornerstone of the documentary, which is how well and how much, you know, how much they cared about Liz as the matriarch of the family. And like, and really like, how much they cared about maintaining tradition and maintaining family and maintaining a closeness and always staying together. Like mm. that is so thorough throughout four episodes. It's indisputable. Like they would go to Griffith park together every Sunday and have a picnic. You know, oh, Candy wow. talked about how they would bake. Right. Liz would start cooking late at night on Saturday night. So that way in the morning, like she would put the bread in the oven and they'd have a, they'd have a nice bread, like, and they would go to the park and play baseball. Huh. It was like, they had, you know, I think there's this feeling that, like, we want to view Liz as if she's unacceptable or, like, in some way as if she's inauthentic or, like, or as if she's not, not true in the truest sense of the word. You know, like, as if we can't, as if there's no way we can validate her as a person. And I think, I think the most remarkable job, and I give all the credit in the world to Zachary Drucker and Elena Carruthers because they, they really did help, like, DuPont Brothers production. It, we, I mean, really did an incredible job working with me and working with everyone on our crew to really understand Liz as a trans woman and to really help bring out the children's viewpoint. So that's what's so beautiful about the documentary is that Candy goes into detail saying, my, you know, my mother was my hero. And not only that, but Candy describes her entire transition, where she started, where she finished with that transition, and all this, all the specific events that that were sprinkled throughout that transition that made it more right. personal and just like it, they made it a very accepting thing so so we established that and then later on saying we really actually deal with the consequences of that life on the road because the, the dale is the one chance of that permanent life if you're kind of viewing it in terms of act you know act one is really establishing that criminal life and right. saying you know there, there was a family life everyone was loved mm -hmm. there was this transition and then the Dale is, this is our chance at a permanent life. Liz could be this, Liz could be this figure in the automotive field and have a permanent life, but then you see it get taken away because of all the, the past, because right. of the crimes. And because of Liz was flagged or, or ID'd or tracked or however you like to use the term as transgender. So she was, she was, uh, oh God, I can't get the word, but she was basically subtly either identified or somebody thought that maybe, you know, like Dick Carlson thought something was off, right? So later on in Act 3, you see the transition where the kids, you see what happens to actually the consequences of it later on down the road now in present day, which is that, you know, Michael says, I can't fill out a job application. You know, Candy says, I don't even have a birth certificate. I'm not a legitimate citizen because I was born under a fictitious name while on the run. Oh, and then it's wow. like, and you see the tragedy of that life and you see how they struggle. You know, Michael, Michael even says, like, I just tell people I'm from California. <laughs> he just doesn't even have a backstory, you know. Can, yeah, you know, Candy doesn't have a birth certificate. Michael doesn't have a backstory. It's all—it's the very nature of the consequences right. of their lives that so, you can have all this love, but still feel a deep sense of regret. Like you know, it's like it's like the Clarence Thomas quote: "You know, the children always pay for the sins of the parents." That is true. And it's you know, so you're really seeing how that that responsibility and that love, you know, sort of becomes. A, a bittersweet and, and, and build towards a little bit of a resentment, I think. And I don't even know if I, if that's the right word. I think I'm just, I don't want to speculate on what the, on what the Michael family thinks, right. but I certainly think that there's an element of sadness and tragedy to not being able to live a full life because of your parents. I, one thing you said on the run. And so I was wondering how, I mean, in the seventies, it was a little easier to be on the run because they didn't have the technology as they do now. But mm -hmm. so Liz and the, and is it Liz and the whole family went on the run was, or did Liz go on the run by herself? And it took a while 
for her to get caught. Is that correct? So there were different various points. Um, the, I guess I'd start by saying the entire family went on the run together. That is one of the sections that's it's about three quarters of that first episode is wow. discussing that exactly that, which that's is what crazy. their life was like. It's the various crimes of Liz when she was representing male. And then you also have, so not just the, the crimes of Liz, but you're also dealing with the family and them being on the run in the various places that they went and how they lived and even how their family connected while they were on the run. You know, one of the other <laughs> points that Candy brings up is that they would put coded messages in the newspaper, the free press. Right. And then, you know, so no matter where they were living, whether it was like Florida or Indiana or Texas or, you know, wherever they went, they would suddenly have family meeting them in a state park somewhere. Like, and, they, and then Candy was always saying, I don't know how they're finding us. We're moving every couple of weeks. Wow. And it was because they were putting coded messages in the paper. Like that was their, that was their life. There was no sense of normalcy. But I the bet. family was always together. So I talk about common threads throughout the series is that Liz was an incredible mother. Like she kept everyone together. So there's this, you know, so we, we, we go through that. And then uh, I'm sure you had a second part of that question, but I can't remember the Wester. Well, it was it was the family, and then how long did it take for Liz to finally get caught? And what was right. what was the cir circumstances of why she got caught? Yeah, so it's, it's <clears throat> so that counterfeiting operation was in 1961. Right. And so basically, she went on the run for 14 years. Effectively, wow, that's a long time. And so it's a long time. And also, you know, the difference between 1961 is that Liz is representing as male in 1961. So. So now you're going to, that transition took place in 1968. So now Liz was living wholeheartedly, you know, as a, wholeheartedly and having transitioned by, um, by 1969, right. 70, um, depending. So you've got, you know, at this point comes into her own working, you know, different sales jobs and then coming into USMI and with the car. And now you're at 1974, 75. And then this what brings up the advent of, of Dick Carlson and Pete Noyes. And that's when you start to arrive at the investigation that undoes everything is, is that when they, they say it, there's a point in the documentary where they say, you know, I shook Liz's hand and something just fell off. <laughs> and it's like, and you are, you realize that, that like, that he's, you know, he, he is, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say that, that I don't want to speak for, for, for Carlson or come over or try to suggest what some of his motivations are. Like that's not my place, right. but just to hear that comment, I think alone is worth considering. As, as to what somebody's intent is so that but ultimately that initial draw for carlson or noise if that was it is to you know it, it triggered something that led to their investigation and then ultimately led to dick carlson outing liz carmichael live on the air in 1975 which is considered a violation in yeah. so in, in in the other in the lgbtqa community so that that's what basically started and, and ended to, to your to end your question I mean, that's a, it's a fascinating story. And what, what, uh, what uh, brought this to your attention? Why, why did you want to direct it? Why, and what, what made you think that this was a, a, a subject that really needed to get out there? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the story itself, of course, yes, it's a, it's a fascinating story, not just uh, of bringing the, this type of car that to the, to the, the forefront, but it was not what he she said but then the trans part too so tell me tell me what really brought this to your attention uh well i i accepted that liz was was trans from minute one i didn't right. that didn't that was not a factor to me i thought she was just an incredible character okay but when i saw that story i thought this is the most incredible story i've ever heard you know and at the time i knew maybe one eighth of what's in the documentary i didn't even know a quarter of what was in that documentary so I just knew that she was remarkable and I wanted to study her and see, you know, what was it that was you know, all the native intelligence or her fearlessness. She was a scrapper and a fighter. It was like, it was all these things. I think they kind of came in a, in a point in my time where I needed to see that. Right. I, you know, sometimes it's a reflection of people thinking aspirationally. And I was going through two of the toughest years of my life from 2001, 2009 to 2011. So I, I was in a pretty dark place. So when I saw that, I was like, it's just really inspiring. I mean, I, I like anti-heroes. You know, I like people who, like people who, who are so um, industrious. That's the word. I was looking for people who, who have, who are like scrappers and scavengers. Right. And, you know, they take what they need to get by and they, and they do it by any means necessary. I really relate to that. And I think there's also a level of, of, of poverty and, and, and that feeling of desperation of you got to move forward. You got to make a life for yourself and you do whatever you can. You know, so I, there's a lot of that aspect in it. 
you know, but also when I, it was really when I went to the Peterson Museum, I met with the chief historian, Leslie Kendall, and he, he had like a 60 minute tape of Liz's interview. Hmm. It's one of the only tapes we were able to find in nine years. Oh, excuse me. Here's your tea Get the rasp out. <laughs> yeah, so I don't talk this much in a single day, <laughs> let alone. Um, but it's, yeah, so, it, so effectively I went to go meet Leslie Kendall and he played the tape for me. It was one of the only tapes he found in nine years. And so because of that, I, when I listened to it, I was just blown away by like, her philosophy, how she talked. It was clear that she was a polymath. It was clear that she was so intelligent about so many different things. She had a philosophy and epistemology. Like, she had a whole worldview about everything that I thought was so completely different than anyone I had heard. And I just thought, what a force of nature. Just, you couldn't stop this woman no matter what. And I just was like, I was in. That was it for me. I was like, okay, and then now I got to go find it. But it took me years. I mean, it took me like three years to find anything on this. So when I was digging, I just kept digging and digging and digging because there was no book, no movie, no right. documentary. Like, no, there's nothing long ever. form. Yeah. What is that? I said, I've never heard of her. So that's, this was great that you brought some something to the table that nobody's heard of. At least I haven't. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's and I, I don't think you're alone in saying that. Our, you know, our co-director Zachary Zucker, who's and by the way, an incredible collaborator. There's, there's no way this turns out this good without Zachary. She's like I, I do consider her a, like a very much way, in many ways a vessel. I think she's she's an incredible um, insight and lifeline into someone like Liz Carmichael because she could she has a lived experience I don't. And so you know when when we connected, I think there's a lot there's a lot to the, to the nature of um, our collaboration, right. but also too that like when I was putting this together, I really struggled to find anything about this. But the fact that we were able to put it together over, I was able to put it together over a period of like I think about six, seven years. Wow! And then putting it together, okay. and then finding these pieces, it still took time. It it still took the, this immense amount of time. You had a follow up question, but I, I wasn't tracking, so I apologize. Oh no, that's okay. It's like you said, we only have a few minutes left anyway. And oh sure. Uh, but I, I my last question would be: Is whatever happened to the car? Was it was it completely f fraud, or was there any any val validity to this uh, fuel efficient car? Uh, I have spent six hours with a mechanic going over the only mechanical prototype that exists. Um, it's owned by a private collector in Los Angeles. Okay. I think that's probably the only thing the collector would want me to say. Right. <laughs> and um, and um, he, he came upon the car in a very fortuitous manner. And um, he's a wonderful person. And uh, and they let, he let me in his garage and I was able to see it. And I went over every inch of that car with the mechanic. I know very definitively the answer to that question but i'll tell you what man the biggest thing i love about storytelling is the act of discovery and this is not cliche i mean this is why i'm into filmmaking is because i love to hear what people think right i know what i think but that that would suck like to be like it's like i don't know it's like asking david lynch what a racer head is about <laughs> like you, you wouldn't like right. because it's it's, right. it's so personal and ethereal and it, it, it's a personal experience to everyone and i would and i just it's like asking a magician how do you do the trick like it, it's the trick would lose its magic, its illusion. Exactly. And I think, and I think the beauty of Liz Carmichael is not knowing. I really do. I think it's no. We want to know. Insane. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, like, well, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But, it's but, over. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you know, but I think there's something to be said. Just, I think there's something to be said about that's the magic of Liz Carmichael is that she could craft her own reality. She made the things that weren't real real. And the things that were too real, you're like, this has to be fake. Like, I think that that she she spins such a beautiful reality together that like that it's her reality, and that's what you're watching right. in a series. It's her reality, and I think it's really just like, just enjoy it, man. Like, you know, it's something you. It's like watching a lunar eclipse or something. A planet aligning. <laughs> you just enjoy it. Right. You know, you don't ask how it's done because you'd get a 30 minute soliloquy, but you don't right. really want it. You. I think it's just the experience. And I, so I know my answer, but I, I wouldn't want to say because I don't want to ruin the joy of Liz Carmichael's reality. All right. So people can watch it. Is it HBO Max or HBO? It's going to air on both. It's going to okay. air uh, Sunday. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just say it's Sunday, January 31st. Uh, the first two episodes are 9 to 11 on HBO and HBO Max. And then the last episode, last two episodes, episodes three and four, they air on the consecutive Sundays. Oh, great. Which are February 7th and 14th, uh, each at 9 o'clock. 
Well, how do people follow you? Because uh, I know I have it down there below. It's Nikki Cams on Instagram. But uh, how do people yep. check you yeah, out? No, no, yeah, I am. Uh, I was terrible at social media until like two weeks ago. <laughs> and then I, it took me an hour to learn how to post on Instagram. But um, I have Instagram or Twitter are probably the best ways to get a hold of me. Okay. Um, and those are both Nikki Cams. Uh, it's N-I-C-K-Y-C-A-M-S. That's just what everyone calls me. That's probably because I don't want to say Camillary. Well, we appreciate you you know, given, giving a story that, like I said, you know, somebody said sounds trippy, uh, because it, ha I mean, it is, it's a, it's a story that I think it, it's interesting because there's, there's deceit, there's lies, there's, you know, all, you know like I said, uh, you know, hiding your, you know, sexual, not, not sexuality, but just your transgender. I mean, it's just you, pretty much anything you can think of is there. I mean, it's almost like a story that you thought would somebody just made up for Hollywood, but this was actually a true story. So, uh, but thank you. Thank you for uh, yeah. bringing this to the table. And uh, next project, if it's something that uh, fits into Truth Be Told, come back and tell us about it. No, I'm happy to. Yeah, Liz, Liz Carmichael lives quite the, quite the incredible life. I think we're all, we're all better for it. Great. Yeah. And well, thanks for having me, Tony. I of course, it. anytime. Well, uh, this is Tony Sweet. So tune in next Friday. We have more shows coming out. Uh, and uh, if you want to go to our website, uh, truthbetoldworldwide.com, check out up any upcoming shows we have. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our uh, podcast on Apple and Spotify and iHeart, pretty much anywhere you can find us, radio.com, all that stuff. But uh, we always appreciate you guys uh, supporting us and being uh, with us every, every week and uh, spread the word. Until then, I'm Tony Sweet for Truth Be Told. Take care of yourself.